Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Today, we'll have a returning guest, uh, Sean Hyman from the Ultimate Wealth Report. Sean, it's good to have you back. Hey, good to be with you. All right. First thing I want to start off start off on is that you wrote about the Elliott Wave uh, theory and how it affects the markets and how you use it. I'm actually not too familiar with the Elliott Wave. Uh, if you briefly could just tell us uh, what it is and how you use it and what you see through it. Yeah, Elliott Wave uh, tracks the sentiment of the markets. And so uh, where, whereas regular technical analysis shows you the trend, um, you're able to see when the trend is in force, but it's hard to tell what stages of the trend you're in, uh, you know, how mature the trend is, when it might possibly end, um, et cetera, or, or when a downtrend might possibly end and reverse. And Elliott Wave helps to give you an idea of where you are within that trend. So there, there, are, there are five up waves and an uptrend, and there's three down waves in a, in a major downtrend. And so um, I can use rules based off Elliott Wave and tell, okay, we're you know we're in a wave three of five. So in other words, I know I'm halfway through the uptrend. Well, that's very helpful to let me know, or or I know um, it, Elliott Wave will tell me how pullbacks react, and I can get some ideas of how far and how severe pullbacks may be within an uptrend. Um, I can tell when they're you know near wave fives, the attributes that are uh, in wave fives, and also it lets me know when I might need to be lightening up some positions and getting out of the market, even though the market's still heading higher. So there's a lot of things that Elliott Wave can help um, kind of tip you off to. Um, it'll also uh, help let you know when some of the biggest surges and moves um, are apt to come, uh, because those tend to happen in wave uh, threes, and so. You know, in, in learning Elliott Wave, you know you want to be in the in, in the in the market before those happen. So a lot of times, stocks will shoot up, and then the media will get on the bandwagon and talk about it. But really, you know, you're learning about it after the fact, and many times you're learning about all that after a huge wave freeze move has happened. And Elliott Wave will help get you in front of that move and before that move by by learning how to count the waves. And that's what I one of the Elements of, uh, of of the analysis of what I do in the Ultimate Wealth Report. So it's just one piece. It's not com- you know completely Elliott Wave, but absolutely I do use that to help me uh, analyze the markets. All right, and you spoke about uh, Wave Three. Are any sectors looking to be in that Wave Three right now that you're looking at, or no sector right now? Yeah, they're actually um, uh, oil and gold uh, and silver in particular. Are uh, have, have completed wave one and two, and they're and they're in the early stages of a wave three advance right now, and so in the coming weeks and months, we're going to see some big surges uh, higher out of all of those, and that probably means we're going to see uh, another down move in the uh, in the U.S. dollar as a result, and so it gives me some good insight on you know what I should be bullish on, what I should be positioned on, so it tells me I should be in gold stocks, oil stocks, silver stocks. Uh, the ETFs that track these, things of that sort. Oh, okay, so you think, uh, you did say on my last interview that gold equities were cheap. Uh, if our listeners listen to you and bought gold equities, they're sitting pretty right now. It's the highest performing asset this year. Mm-hmm. So you did say that for a while, so it's good to know that we haven't hit that stage three yet. Um, so do you have any equities in particular that you're looking at, like the juniors or the large caps, or is it diversified? Yeah, the as far as uh, individual stocks, I would I would like to first start with some of the biggest uh, gold miners and some of the, the most well-capitalized. So that would start with uh, stocks like Barrett Gold, symbol ABX. Uh, they're getting ready to go into a wave three. Or um, Newmont Mining, which is a little bit earlier on in the process. They um, – are heading into a wave one, so they've got you know they'll be trailing uh, Barrett Gold, so there'll be kind of like a tier two uh, up move, whereas ABX Barrett Gold will be a wave you know a, a, a uh, kind of leading the pack uh, as it comes to gold stocks. So that's the best way that I like to do it on an individual basis. Um, some people can also broadly diversify by just getting in something like GDX, which is a, a gold mining. Uh, ETF that has a number of uh, gold mining stocks in it, and that's another uh, more diversified way to uh, to play that as well. All right, and uh, your latest article, speaking of all this uh, alternative to the dollars, was about Bitcoin. 
Uh, it's a little different. We've had Trace Meyer, uh, Jeff Berwick, Jeffrey Tucker, a lot of pro Bitcoins. Yours is a different beat. Can you explain just your point of view on Bitcoin and what you think of it right now? Yeah, I've I've called the last three declines in in uh, in Bitcoin, and um, and I've recently commented just in some minor areas like on Facebook and stuff that that I think that Bitcoin will probably get a bounce. However, I still believe it to be a horrible asset, and so therefore I won't even participate in the, in in the upward bounces, and that's because. Uh, it's basically an asset that is um, – if, if it's a currency, it's not able to be widely used, um, and it's also getting less used all the time because uh, China has banned it. Apple has taken off all the uh, Bitcoin wallet apps off of their uh, iPhones and iPads. Uh, many other countries have come on board and either discouraged the use of it or have, have banned the use of it. So it's, it's something that is already finding a lot of um, resistance. And a lot of that is because when you look at it through governmental eyes, um, what government wants a competing currency, what government wants a currency that they can't control, and more importantly, what government wants a currency that they can't track and therefore they can't prove that you need to pay taxes on something so they, have, they could potentially have huge loss of tax revenue, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I think that um, that will have, it'll eventually fizzle out and you know not make it many years down the road from now because governments are going to be so resistant to it when they realize the the amount of tax dollars that they could lose if more people shifted into Bitcoin versus being in their traditional uh, traditional currencies. I was wondering in terms of sh uh, shifting assets, do you think any governments? might embrace it like maybe one that generally is a uh one where you want to move funds to like maybe a switzerland or uh cayman islands or do you think it's just the big boys like the u.s or china or russia will just be too much to overcome well the reason china one of the reasons china got so bearish on it and, and banned it and, and not allowed their banks to deal in it anymore is because of just that you could only move so much money out of china they're very restrictive on how much money you can take out of the country so what a lot of people got you know wise to was that hey i can put money in bitcoin and a lot more larger quantity than my government allows because they can't track it or trace it anyway uh, send that out to somewhere else and, and buy something outside of the, the the country with that Bitcoin and then sell that asset and turn it back into cash in that local uh, currency in that local country. And then voila, I've got my money out of China and more diversified and into another uh, country. And, of course, China really tries to keep a lid on that, and they want to make sure you know people can't just move money out of the country very freely. And so in those instances, of course, it was you know Bitcoin lovers' dream, and so they were some of the ones that were initially pushing up uh, Bitcoin. A ton of the Bitcoin buying was coming out of China until the uh, Chinese government put a lid on that. Oh, all right, yeah, and Russia's, I think they've uh, expressed anger towards it too. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? So, and speaking of Russia, uh, there's been a lot of geopolitical tension. Uh, what do you think? What effects do you think it has on the markets? On Monday, we saw gold sprouted up, uh, stock market was declined, but then Putin, uh, quote unquote, eased tension. I, I don't know if he really did. I think he just <laughs> made that something to maybe keep his market from crashing. But uh, uh, what do you think this effect of Russia and Ukraine is going to have on the markets? Well, it, uh, it it definitely is not uh, a bullish thing for for stocks. I mean, I know stocks were up, you know, today, but they took this huge hit yesterday. Um, and the reason is because uh, of really two things. One, markets hate uncertainty, and, and, and we don't know what Putin's going to do, you know, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, he he kind of made it act like today he was backing off and and, and not being quite so stern. But, um, you know, you just never know how that's going to fly. We could wake up tomorrow morning and, you know, and he's got tanks firing off uh, around <laughs> into the Ukraine. So, so, so investors hate uncertainty, so it makes them skittish. It adds volatility to the market, which investors hate. Um, and also right now uh, a lot of stock markets, particularly here in the U.S., are, in, are, are at very high uh, valuations according to their um, – the PEs or price earnings ratio. So it means stocks are expensive relative to corporate earnings, uh, you know, overall. 
And so it won't take much for a lot of institutions to hit the sell button and run somewhere. And so if things got out of hand in Ukraine and the U.S. or Europe got heavily involved against Russia because of this, that would be all it would take to really stir the pot. And so it's causing a lot of excess volatility in stocks. Now, the good if you could say there's a good side of it or a positive side of it, um, if you are uh, into – Commodities, commodity stocks, uh, commodity ETFs, things of that sort, um, of course, then uh, you'll see that oil is rising, oil stocks are doing good, uh, gold is doing well, gold stocks are doing well, uh, silver and silver stocks are doing well. So um, there's there's uh, wheat, which is going up, so there's there's grain ETFs that somebody can uh, follow that are, that are doing well because Russia is a huge oil exporter and producer and grain producer and exporter. And if something happens there, there's the fear that the supplies could be tapered or possibly cut off or hindered uh, while there was a war going on, if there should be one. And, of course, that would crimp the supplies, yet the demand would still be just as large for oil, grains, etc. So all that would drive the prices of those up. So that's why those were responding upon this news you know, to the upside. All right. And I was wondering also, is in terms of just this isn't a prediction, just I would say mainly a thought because predicting is what do you think? How do you think this is going to play out? Do you think uh, Russia is going to end up using force or do you think they're going to back off? I, I think if they're wise, they back off. But you, you just never know with Russia. Russia is not always rational. Um, I, I don't think, um, unfortunately, that they're necessarily scared of the the U.S., but I'll think, I also think it's already become very costly for Russia. Um, <clears throat> their central bank has already spent about $10 billion trying to defend their ruble, which has been plummeting. Uh, their stock market uh, fell, you know, 7 to 10 percent over, over a couple of days, um, so a lot of wealth eroded uh, there from some of Russia's wealthiest stockholders. Um, so, you know, they've already taken somewhat of a hit. And that wouldn't even have uh, that wouldn't even start to begin to think about the economic impact that could be you know that could happen in Russia because a lot of the world would cut Russia off uh, if they really go into a full blown war. Um, the U.S. Are, has already hinted at that, and other countries as well. So um, so if they're smart, they'll just try to you know I think they'll probably just try to play tough and eventually back off. Um, but you just never know what Russia is going to do because. Putin is uh, half insane. <laughs> <laughs> half, I think, might be a compliment to him. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no one really knows in, uh, what Putin's going to do. It's hard to predict, uh, especially in this age, government policy, I would say, because they always seem to change the rules. Uh, and I was wondering, do you think what do you think would happen if the U.S. Uh, ended up passing sanctions on Russia? How do you think that would affect the markets? Well, you know, it would just provide more intensity, more uncertainty, more the likelihood that Russia would retaliate in some way. Um, you know, so it would it would likely not be good for stocks at large, including our stocks. Um, it could temporarily hit Russian stocks again. Now, Russian stocks are actually very cheap right now, according to their uh, P/E ratio. So actually, there's probably a lot of opportunity uh, to be had in buying Russian stocks as long as somebody has. Uh, an outlook that they can hold it for a year or two or three. If they have that kind of outlook, then then they would probably be fine, you know, buying here. Uh, of course, there will be a lot of volatility, a lot of ups and downs, and that just comes with the territory of buying something at a deep value and with uh, tumultuous times, um, and and uh, and with the realization that it could go lower before it goes higher. But uh, but I think that's one of the value spots of the world right now is Russian stocks. And an easy way to play that is through something like an ETF, like RSX, which uh, which tracks a basket of Russian stocks. All right, I actually want to switch switch subjects now. So we talked a lot about Russia. It's good insights. And uh, Janet Yellen is now officially the new uh, Fed chairman or chairwoman. Uh, I don't know which one to call it, but uh, her first meeting is. In March, I forget the exact date, but what do you expect from her? Do you think she could possibly just uh, live up to her dovish reputation, or do you think she might try to prove that she's not such a dove and keep the tapering? Uh, what do you expect for the beginning parts, not the long-term 
uh, Janet Yellen policy, but from just the first one or two months of Janet Yellen? Yeah, I, my guess is that she will uh, continue on uh, the tapering path to, to you know, provide some continuity uh, from where Bernanke left off, so it seems like they're on the same page, on the same team, with the same game plan. Um, of course, in the future, that could always change, uh, but I, I do expect that over time she's going to continue to print money. I think she'll print more money than Bernanke did, just like Bernanke printed more than Greenspan did. And so they've got to keep the game going. And so I think that she will outdo uh, any of them before it's all said and done. And I think that that will ultimately hurt the dollar, push up inflation, and uh, will be you know good days for gold, silver, oil, and uh, copper, and and, and the, uh, the 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 miners and producers of those commodities. All right, that sounds great. And the last thing is, uh, I remember seeing last time you interviewed with me and I actually saw you on TV I think a month or two ago but mm-hmm. uh you called big oil a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh what do you think of uh do you think oil big oil is still a no brainer? I think it presents a great uh value also. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um it, the one is because the the market has it wrong on oil. See the the story was is that we're producing Tons of oil were awash in oil, and so therefore oil was going to go down. And so, so um, you know, much of the investing community was bearish on oil. And I was on the other side of that equation, saying, you know, yeah, we're we're uh, producing a lot of oil, but we're producing the costly oil right now. So conventional oil, we could just drill a hole where we found oil, oil shoots up, and we're good to go, and it was very cheap to to do. Um, unconventional oil is shale oil, and we're having to drill deep, and we're having to drill sideways, and it's very expensive, and those oil wells deplete much faster than conventional uh, oil wells, and yet they're much more costly to do. So oil has to remain higher uh, in order for for us to drill uh, those wells that are much more costly. Also, it takes energy to make energy uh, to, to make oil. In other words, we have to use oil in the machinery to go down there and get the oil. And when oil's at $100 a barrel, um, of course, it's more costly to drill for oil than when it was, you know, 20, 30, and 40 dollars a barrel. So that is another reason why oil has to remain high because it's expensive to go get it and it has to be worth uh, going down there and getting it. And the other reason is because OPEC uh, needs a huge. Pro- uh, to meet their OPEC budgets. So they figure out what their governmental budgets are, and most of their money is derived from um, uh, from the uh, oil revenue. And so right now they need anywhere from, you know, 90 95 to $110 a barrel uh, to meet their budgets, and those budgets keep getting bigger and bigger each and every year. So there's a lot of reasons why I feel that oil will continue to rise overall. I mean, it'll have its swings here and there, but overall I believe it will be high and rising uh, with with some dips and bumps along the way, and that's why I believe that oil is a, a no-brainer. So the big oil companies, um, ENI symbol E, uh, British Petroleum symbol BP, uh, some of these I think will will perform very well and and do well during that time. All right, and lastly, uh, just to close on, you did talk about Apple. I haven't followed it much, but. Would you be willing to give us just an update on Apple, what you think of it? And I know Carl Icahn was in the news about it. Uh, I'm glad he backed off about it. It seems like every stock he touches has some sort of turbulence afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Apple was one that um, Elliott Waves and Sentiment Analysis got me into. Um, everybody loved it when it was back at 700. They hated it at 400. So that, that made me take note. So the sentiment was atrocious. And um, Sir John Templeton always said, by the point of maximum pessimism, and it just couldn't always seem to get more pessimistic than that. People were writing Apple off as a has-been company and et cetera. And when I looked at its balance sheet, I just didn't see that. Um, I saw the, you know, the world's biggest cash hoard of any company in the, in the world and somebody that still made a product that people wanted and with you know, further things coming in the pipeline in the future. And Elliott Wave analysis told me that was probably coming you know, towards its lows, so we bought in at 419 um, and rode it up to 572, and uh, we bought in right before one of those um, wave threes, you know, that took it from a little over 400 up to 572. So that's the power of a Elliott Wave Wave Three example in real life. Um, now it's pulled back, it had one of its three wave corrections, and so we just recently got in. Um, I believe it was 520, 518. 
518 and change is what we uh, got back in at. And uh, I expect long term for it to go to, you know, 650, 700 again uh, fairly easily, um, you know, over the next, you know, at least 18, 24 months. All right. And so lastly, just uh, it was nice having you on. Thank you. Uh, 